A few weeks ago I watched the acclaimed 2022 documentary Fire of Love, which tells the story of Katja and Maurice Kraft, two scientists who dedicated their entire lives to studying and capturing the mysteries and majesty of volcanoes all around the world, and who, in 1991, both died during an unexpectedly violent eruption. The film got nominated for an Oscar and it's quite good. But unbeknownst to many, in that same year, there was another filmmaker who made his own documentary about the crafts. And I can tell you, this one is something else. This is Werner Herzog's The Fire Within. The film opens with a single shot. Accompanied by a classical requiem and a voiceover from Herzog himself who explains how his intention is not to offer an extensive biography of the crafts, but rather to celebrate, as he puts it, the wonder of their imagery. If you're familiar with Herzog's filmography, you know that these words carry a deeper significance than a mere desire to show you some pretty images. For like the crafts chasing their passion, Herzog has been on a quest of his own for many decades now. One that brought him all across the world, from the desolate plains of Antarctica to the northern edges of the Taiga Forest. He descended down the most sacred caves in France, ventured deep into the Amazon jungle, captured burning oil fields and forgotten deserts, active volcanoes and strange underwater landscapes. It granted him the pretty impressive accolade of being the only filmmaker to have made a movie on every single continent. But what unites all these endeavors is a specific search. A search for what he has on more than one occasion referred to as adequate images. Give us adequate images. We, we lack adequate images. Our civilization doesn't have adequate images. That's what I'm working on. A new grammar of images. This video is brought to you by Mubi. Go to mubi.com slash like stories of old for an extended free trial. It's hard to define what exactly Herzog means with adequate images, especially in today's landscape where so much is captured and witnessed, where so often it feels like we are drowning in images. What separates noise from signal? What makes an image truly stand out? Hey, you little champion. Hi. To answer that, let's briefly revisit this documentary Grizzly Man. Here we have another film that is largely comprised of archival footage. In this case, the footage comes from Timothy Treadwell an activist who was killed by a grizzly bear after having dedicated years of his life to their protection. The story is not unlike that of the crafts, and it is clear that Herzog is fascinated by eccentric individuals whose passions ultimately end up consuming them. Though it must be noted that whereas in The Fire Within, where Herzog has nothing but admiration for the crafts, in Grizzly Man he is far more critical of Treadwell. Here I differ with Treadwell. I believe the common denominator of the universe is not harmony, but chaos, hostility, and murder. Throughout the film, he expresses fundamental philosophical differences and places question marks to both the effectiveness of Treadwell's protective endeavors, as well as to the qualities of his character. Now Treadwell crosses a line with the park service, which we will not cross. What Herzog cannot deny, however, is the beauty of Treadwell's footage. What are you doing up there? That's where you're sitting? Having shot so much material, Treadwell often captured, as Herzog described it, that which Hollywood filmmakers can only dream of. Spontaneous moments that cannot be staged, rare occurrences that demand patience, all the things that remain elusive on productions with tight budgets and even tighter schedules. There is something like an inexplicable magic of cinema. Hi, Spirit. In one particularly relevant moment, Herzog considers the empty pauses between Treadwell running out of and coming back into the frame. Treadwell probably did not realize that seemingly empty moments had a strange secret beauty. Sometimes images themselves develop their own life, their own mysterious stardom. Although I think I understand what he was trying to say here, that sometimes an image can grab us in a way that we can't fully explain, as if our subjective self suddenly makes a very concrete connection to what appears to be some innate quality of this external object. I'm not sure he was able to fully get his point across with a shot of branches and bushes swaying in the wind. But with the footage of the crafts, on the other hand...
here we can see one notable difference with Fire of Love. Because whereas that documentary also had some beautiful looking montages showing us, in some cases, the exact same images that the fire within does, the effect nevertheless feels significantly different. This is, in large part, because Fire of Love is just so much more fast paced. Images come and go so quickly that they don't really have a chance to reveal that strange secret beauty, to take the spotlight with their own mysterious stardom. Instead, they feel subservient to whatever predetermined emotion the narrative wants you to experience. You know, like the director is telling you, be in awe, feel the romance, and now the comedy, and so on. Now, take a look at how Herzog does this. As you can see, aside from just telling us about the lives of the crafts, Herzog also really lets us sit with their volcanic images, with the longest sequence, one that captures the turbulent volcanic action in Hawaii, even going on for well over seven minutes without any narration. To be clear though, Herzog is also directing the audience here. He's not just letting us stare at some interesting shots until meaning emerges. But the difference is that he does place the images front and center, and subsequently stylizes the experience insofar as it helps us to truly consider them, to bring about that strange secret beauty. Most obviously he directs the tone by setting the footage to a number of operatic musical pieces. In general he seems to prefer classical music in his films, probably for its timeless and emotionally complex nature that demands active listenership. But there's also more subtle and more interesting ways in which he guides our experience. For example, Herzog usually gives us a quick prompt before a major montage, some idea or frame of reference to think about as we are witnessing the footage. Before these scenes of an Icelandic village that was surprised by an eruption, Herzog talks about Maurice capturing an apocalypse as never seen before on film. And before that great Hawaiian sequence, he talks about the crafts wanting to make a film about creation in the making, a film that they unfortunately never got to finish. Was this really their intention? Maybe, maybe not. The exact facts don't always matter that much to Herzog. Rather, he embellishes and invokes metaphors because he wants these images to awaken within us something beyond their surface level reality. Again, Herzog didn't just want to offer a biography like Fire of Love does. He felt that, hidden within these images, there was a deeper story a deeper truth to be found, one that was bound to be overlooked by biographical accounts like Fire of Love that got away before it has the chance to truly reveal itself. So there's an accountant's truth and there's something much deeper. And you will find that in great poetry, when you listen or when you read a great poem, it will occur to you very abruptly that there's a deep, enormous truth in this poem. And, and you, you feel like illuminated. And you don't have to analyze, and you don't have to read uh, uh, lots of literature about this very poem. You just know it in instantly. And why do you know it? Because there's an ecstasy of truth that is in this poem. And in cinema you have this as well. Throughout his career, Herzog has often spoken of an ecstatic truth, or a poetic truth. A mysterious and elusive phenomenon existing independently from our factual reality. Even though, much to Herzog's disdain, many documentaries in his perception often fail to make the distinction. We must ask of reality, how important is it, really, Herzog wrote. Of course, we can't disregard the factual, it has normative power. But it can never give us the kind of illumination, the ecstatic flash from which truth emerges. For that, he argued, it is we ourselves who have to engage with it. As the philosopher Albert Camus once stated, everything has its truth. Consciousness illuminates it by paying attention to it. And this is what Herzog tries to achieve by stylizing the factual reality in the way that he does. But as he shows in his documentary, the crafts themselves, to some extent, already did this too. 
in another diversion from the kind of documentary making we saw in Fire of Love. Herzog also makes a point of showing some of the behind-the-scenes action from the crafts, which can be somewhat disillusioning. Like the way they once scaled a volcano that was actually so touristic that a woman made it up there in high heels and a bikini. How Maurice tried to alter his public persona by emulating the famous French adventurer Jacques Cousteau, and how many of the scenes they shot were staged or reenacted over multiple takes. For the camera, they repeated several times all fake. It makes you wonder, if this film is supposed to celebrate the beauty of their work and the magic of their adventure, then why break the spell? Well, this is because Herzog doesn't want to portray the crafts as scientists who just happened upon beautiful imagery, but as filmmakers who thought about the importance of framing and composition, of conveying a sense of scale, and of infusing their shots with a flair of drama. As if out of nowhere, the images become grandiose. A great filmmaker is born. In short, he wants us to see them as people who were deliberately and willfully engaged in an art form, who were not just trying to capture what was, but who were trying to express something deeper, who were searching for a deeper strata of truth, as Herzog once called it, the one that can be reached only through fabrication and imagination and stylization. In her essay on Herzog's filmmaking philosophy, Maria Popova elaborates that truth in this context is not reality, but rather a subset of reality, existing alongside the factual and the question of meaning, which altogether encompass the landscape that our consciousness dwells in. In this sense, she continues, it rings closer to the definition of truth once given by Friedrich Nietzsche, who defined it as a movable host of metaphors, metonymies, and anthropomorphisms. In short, a sum of human relations which have been poetically and rhetorically intensified, transferred, and embellished. To put it more simply, ecstatic truth is essentially an act of creation, combining the subjective and the objective to transform it into something more, something that gives us deeper insight into the human experience, and that connects us to a greater whole. It is something that is deeply inside of us, dormant inside of us, and I'm the one who can awaken these images. And it's your images, actually, and it's like a, a brother or a sister, unknown, unbeknownst to you, who all of a sudden comes to life and you realize you've got a brother. In the case of the fire within, the kind of insights, the kind of ecstatic truth that one might experience probably feels close to what philosophers have also described as experiences of the sublime, which, to simplify it somewhat, articulates the conflicted sensation, a strange mix of pleasure, fear and awe, that can be experienced when witnessing objects of such vast and overpowering magnitude that they could destroy the observer. Schopenhauer once made a ranking with varying degrees of sublime experiences, ranging from weaker feelings of the sublime that may be invoked by images of strange, desolate landscapes, all the way to experiencing the sublime in its fullness, the sublime as it arises through forces of nature that are so overwhelming, so violent and turbulent, that they directly and inescapably put us face to face with the sheer immensity, both in space and in time of the universe as a whole. It's a humbling experience, one that renders us infinitely small, fleeting and vulnerable. But as such, it's a deeply humanistic experience too. It raises a mirror to who we are as the observers of all this terrifying magnificence. It certainly seemed to have done so for the crafts, at one point, Herzog talks about their work evolving more and more towards humanism as they were increasingly affected by the structural failings to warn and evacuate local populations, which led to their cameras shifting away from eruptions and towards those who were suffering in their wake. In essence, they became less concerned with the science of volcanoes, and more so with their relation to the meaning and value of human life. Now, you can probably also understand what Herzog means by adequate images, and why he finds them so important. They are captured moments that are so dense with reality that they become, to some extent, surreal. They break the mundanity of the world around us, make us see it once again as strange and mysterious. 
and in doing so, they make us ecstatically aware of ourselves too. Make us contemplate the meaning of our own existence and humanity. That, it seems, is the secret beauty, the poetic truth that goes beyond the factual reality, that makes us look at the world around us and see our own reflection, our own deepest selves. This is also why Herzog so often equates outer landscapes with the internal ones of his subjects, like he did in Grizzly Man. It seems to me that this landscape in turmoil is a metaphor of his soul. Or in Nomad, Herzog's documentary about the iconic travel writer Bruce Chatwin. This is a dreaming place, I mean these hills. His inner landscape. His inner landscape, yeah. Landscape of his soul. I think so. And so too, when Herzog looks at the shot of Maurice, he sees more than a volcanic eruption. He sees, as he puts it, a fire within, taking hold of Maurice and of Katja, who is holding the camera. It communicates visually an inner passion and a love story. Because as Herzog narrates in the closing lines of the film, what he saw in the footage of the crafts, beyond the sublime wonder of their images, was a deep and beautifully inspiring bond between two people who, precisely because of their unity, because of their togetherness, were able to descend into the inferno and wrestle an image from the very claws of the devil. It's a story that ends on a visual carrying an equally powerful metaphorical weight. Walking along the precipice, Herzog observes, Maurice films an abyss too close. And so he concludes, Katja must have held him so he wouldn't fall. It is kind of ironic that even though Herzog didn't set out to offer us an extensive biography of the crafts, it's his film that, in the end, made me feel closest to them. After watching The Fire Within, I came to understand them not as subjects of a romanticized story, but as human beings who, despite having lived entirely different lives, driven by entirely different passions, still feel relatable who I can still feel a very real connection with. And, and this is wonderful if I can create that. And, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, in, in rare moments it happens when you hear great music or when you see a great movie, very rarely it happens that, that you have moments of, of deep illumination and moments where, where you know that you are not alone anymore. And it's this deeply humanistic value lying at the heart of Herzog's notion of ecstatic truth that also explains why all this matters so much. It's because, well, I think Herzog already explained it best. My belief is that all these dreams are, are yours as well. And that is what poetry or painting or literature or filmmaking is all about. It's as simple as that. And I, I make films because I have not learned anything else. And it is my duty, because this uh, might be the, the inner chronicle of what we are. And we have to articulate ourselves, otherwise we would be cows in the field. If you want to further explore the inner chronicle of what we are, and not be left like a cow in the field, be sure to check out today's sponsor and friend of the channel, Mubi. Mubi is my personal go-to platform to really explore the riches of cinema. They offer an impressive library filled with hand-picked films from all around the world. For those who are new to cinema, there are the timeless masterpieces to lay the foundations. And for the veteran cinephiles, there are tons of hidden gems and festival favorites. There are even curated series and specials that are really fun and useful if you want to explore a specific theme, era, or director. Either way, with Mubi you'll never run out of great films. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days by using my personal link, that's mubi.com slash likestoriesofold, which you can also find in the description below. So be sure to claim your extended free trial to start your free month of great cinema today.